So our next speaker is Catherine Elmer from the University of Glasgow. Just, is this just where we're starting? Uh, I'm Catherine Elmer from the University of Glasgow. And I'm going to speak on parallel and non-parallel aspects of evolution in Arctic char, uh, which we have up in Scotland. Uh, I'm not originally from Scotland. I'm from Toronto, so at the far other end of these uh, waters. And so I'm very happy to be back on this really uh, beautiful inland seas, freshwater seas we have here. Uh, and in contrast to what uh, Louis just presented, I'm quite new to char work, so I don't have 20 plus years to present, but I'm going to show some uh, recent work that we've been doing since I arrived a few years ago at the University of Glasgow. Uh, my interest is mostly in uh, population genetics and adaptation genomics, uh, and I've been working together uh, with Colin Adams in particular on ecological divergence, and I'm really appreciative of the support from many of the char fanatics communities as we've just been starting up this work. So I'm interested in, in asking, uh, identifying the genetic basis of adaptive traits in wild populations. And this is extremely difficult to do because uh, genomes are large, uh, populations are highly variable, they have complex differing demographic histories, different local environments, um, uh, different phenotypes, many, many different aspects that are difficult uh, to make it difficult to disentangle the genetic basis of those adaptive phenotypes of interest, as we just saw in, uh, in, the, in some of Louis' work. And so the focus that I've taken uh, in my research is to, to use the insights that are possible from parallel evolution or convergent evolution to remove a little bit of this noise of local stochastic variation. So that is when we have an ancestral, so these are not char, <laughs> this is uh, just so a more general idea. So we have an ancestral uh, lake population that repeatedly colonizes new lakes uh, and we have similar phenotypes arise in each of those different lakes. And so with each of these replicates, we can reduce a little bit of the local variation noise and increase the, what we'd like to have as the sort of pure signal. And so Arctic char are fantastic models for this because, uh, as many people are aware here, there are a number of different ecotypes that have diverged along the depth axis. Uh, so in this talk today, we look at uh, primarily at uh, benthivorous fishes, at planktivores, and also some piscivores. And so this is a renowned system for this rapid divergence in trophic morphology or ecotypes or ecomorphs. However, much of the work had been done, uh, extremely detailed work that has been really an important start uh, from different sites. Uh, my work was aiming to try to generalize more across larger geographic areas. So in this talk, I'll look uh, uh, at, at a number of different hierarchies. So looking within and across lakes, within single regions and across regions, in ecomorphology, in population genomics, then looking at signals of outliers, positive selection, and genotype, phenotype associations. And then fourth, some ecological transcriptomics work. So again, using this framework of parallel evolution and ancestral population, repeatedly um, colonizing new lakes and having similar ecotypes arise. Uh, and this work has been done uh, as part of collaborations of many people. Um, Arne Jacobs has led this study. He uh, just finished his PhD last week in my group. And Madeline Carruthers, uh, who worked on the ecological transcriptomics. Andrei Yurchenko, who is a bioinformatician uh, in our group for the last couple of years. And uh, of course, our, our char expert extraordinaire in Glasgow, Colin Adams. 
And this work that I'll present today was just public, we've, uh, sorry, is available now as a preprint uh, on BioArchive. So the populations that we looked at were in Scotland and in Russia, and the Russian work was done in collaboration with Natalia Dordiva and Sergei Alexeyev, who, who, who uh, provided many samples and a lot of uh, information for us. So we had populations that were uh, from a number of lakes in Scotland and a number of lakes in the Transbaikalian region, representing planktivores, benthivores, piscivores, and what I'll call unimodal populations, or those populations that don't have different ecotypes. I'm not going to go into great detail on the ecomorphology, but we, uh, uh, just to, 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 to show the extent of the variation, so here based on a number of linear measures from a fish, this represents about 1,550 fish. From Scotland and Russia, each of the different uh, colors are different ecotypes, and then we have different lakes. So you can see that the measures that we use can resolve variation, uh, uh, or sorry, can distinguish variation that's present between ecomorphs within lakes and also finds, of course, a strong signal among lakes. But of this variation, I'm primarily interested in those uh, components of phenotype that are parallel, so that are consistently differing uh, either in the same or, or, uh, direction between ecotypes across different lakes. And so these plots show differences between uh, benthivore and uh, planktivore ecomorphs with a line uh, joining within a lake and then between piscivore and planktivore. And there's quite a bit of variation, so some instances there's parallelism, some instances there's, there's non-parallelism. But we find that some traits in particular, such as eye diameter, is highly parallel, and head depth, uh, also quite parallel over here as well. So we found, concluded then, that some traits of particular ecological relevance were, were more parallel than would be expected. And this is associated with changes in head shape that happen with ecological specialization. So I, that was, I was just going to touch today on this ecomorphological work. There was more, uh, more that was done because primarily the point was to look at this ecological variation as far as its genetic patterns and its genetic basis. So how can this ecomorphological parallelism arise in natural populations? So to do this, we looked at genetic variation across this, uh, two lineages. So this represents two post-glacial lineages of char, the most divergent lineages, the Atlantic and the Siberian. And we used uh, DDRADSeq, where we cut the genome uh, at known sites, uh, and then sequence those regions. And then we retain only those genetic variants that are polymorphic. So here we had 12,000 SNPs from about 200,000 loci. And this figure is to just show that we had considerable uh, differences between the, each of the lineages, as we'd expect. And we also, these are showing different lakes. We also have relationships uh, clearly defined among lakes. This sets up our neutral genetic variation, our background of differences. But we know that then many of these populations have distinct uh, evolutionary histories of post-glacial times. So we tested two models to try to, or sorry, we tested uh, many different models, in fact, of the evolutionary history to ask whether we were comparing sort of apples and apples when we look at, um, at, at parallelism or whether these are cover overcoming many different uh, non-parallel histories. So the two main models uh, that I'll focus on are those that looked at isolation with migration. So that is the true sort of sympatric speciation or uh, divergences arising overcoming gene flow or that of secondary contact, which is of course quite common in post-glacial fishes where there's a, a period of allopatry, then they, there's an, a period of admixture, and again, divergence. So I'm not, I distinguish this a bit from, from multiple invasion, where we have two clean invasions, uh, to one of, of some periods of allopatry. And what we found was that there was uh, a couple of populations that showed a very most likely uh, signal of divergence is this true sympatric speciation. So those were two of them in Scotland, Loch Awe and Nasilga, where the, there was very low genetic difference between ecomorphs, so both the ecomorphs are in these plots. Uh, this is a structure plot where each bar represents a different individual and the colors are different genetic clustering. So in two populations we had most likely a history of true sympatric divergence. In many populations, we had a signal of secondary contact, so uh, 
two main populations in Scotland where we had uh, considerable genetic differentiation between the, what are now sympatric ecotypes. And then all of the e Russian populations, we also had a strong signal of secondary contact. Should have noted some of the Russian populations are, are trimorphic and some of them are, are bimodal. So we have really quite a lot of variation and differences in demographic histories, even between populations that were really geographically close to each other. We wanted to then look at the genome-wide representation of outlier loci. This is loci that show most extreme signals of divergence compared to background between different ecotypes. And the main point from here is that, uh, so sorry, each of these bars is, the, is, the, is one lake where we have uh, one lake with a comparison of two ecotypes. And what we see is that most of these regions are population specific. You can see that these red bars where there are outlier loci are distributed across the genomes. There is only, in fact, one region where we had a high level of differentiation that was shared between six different ecomorph pairs. So for the most part, extremely population specific levels of uh, outlier loci. Similarly, looking at signals of selection, so here we have separated the Atlantic lineage and the Siberian lineage. And we have about 600 SNPs in each that show a signal characteristic of a response to positive selection. So these are genomic regions that are really uh, showing signals of divergence under selection. So though we have about 600 in each lineage, we found that there were only 18 SNPs that were shared between both lineages. So this is in fact uh, not significantly different than our, than our null distribution. Then we looked at the genetic uh, association between these ecomorph phenotypes and the, and the genetic uh, basis. And we found that loci were widely distributed across the genome. So we would expect that these are highly polygenic traits that are associated with ecomorph. They differ as in, uh, in, in head shape, in body size, in growth, in many different aspects. Uh, and so here we have a plot across the genome. Again, we've separated the lineages. Here's the Atlantic lineage and the Siberian lineage. And the red dots show regions that are significantly associated with, with ecomorph but they are mostly of sparse effect distributed genome-wide. We had one shared region uh, between both lineages that was significantly shared, and this was uh, included genes that were associated, uh, that have been known to be linked to uh, skeletonogenesis and teleosts, uh, including signaling pathways. Then we explored the influence of environment in, and ecological opportunity in these sort of uh, population genetic and ecomorphological patterns. So here we have a, a plot of e, what we call ecosystem size, which is a PC that represents uh, lake depth, lake volume, etc. a number of different components put together, and we call this ecosystem size. And here, a little bit counterintuitively, so larger ecosystems are on, are on the negative, uh, and smaller on the positive. And we find that genetic diversity is related to lake size, such that larger lakes have higher levels of genetic diversity. So this suggests a role of ecological opportunity. However, there's not such a relationship here. This is just a, uh, for illustration purposes, but we see our trimodal lakes and our, our unimodal lakes and our bimodal lakes are in fact, there's not a strong relationship between levels of genetic diversity for the whole population uh, and numbers of ecomorphs. Here we have on this plot uh, PST, which is the phenotypic difference between ecomorphs within a lake. And again, we see that there's a relationship with, eco, um, with ecosystem size. So smaller eco, uh, uh, ecosystems have a lower difference between ecomorphs. Again, this was a post hoc assessment. The study wasn't designed, so I realized the sample sizes are a bit small because we have all of the different comparisons. But I think there is a a suggestive relationship. So we find that these population genomic patterns are extremely population specific. Um, I admit that it, we, you know, at this geographic scale, we thought that between lineages, we would be really finding those loci a very strong effect and signal in generating these ecomorphs. I was surprised at the level of population specificity even among neighboring lakes in Scotland. So then we asked, how can these very parallel ecomorphologies be generated? 
And is there parallelism of something more than just ecomorphology? This is something I would call uh, the inclusive phenotype. So the things that really differ among fishes, their, their growth rate, their swimming performance, uh, many different aspects than just linear measures of the head. And so to do this, we took an ecological transcriptomics uh, approach where we looked at variation in white muscle, so associated with swimming. Uh, and we mapped, we, we took fresh caught samples from the wild and did a sequencing of this expressed genome, the RNA uh, RNA seq. And what we found was that there was a good strong signal of ecomorph in these data, despite the fact that they were wild caught and therefore of different ages and experiences. So really this does reflect differences uh, at a very fundamental level. So here we have differences between ecomorphs. We use these then, of course, to explore the parallel evolution aspect and ask how many different uh, differentially expressed genes were shared. And so we found that in contrast to what we had seen in the population genomic patterns, many different ecomorphs were shared, or sorry, many different uh, differentially expressed genes were shared between ecomorphs, much higher uh, than in the population genomics. And all of the comparisons that are seen, oops, sorry. All of the comparisons that are seen here with astrocytes included a significant sharing of differentially expressed genes. Several of these genes that were the top shared differentially expressed genes, uh, I won't go into detail into what was um, into all of the genes, but these were uh, three of the, of the most uh, differentially expressed and shared genes. And you can see that we have a consistent difference between ecotypes, which are shown in different colors and levels of expression. In these three genes that are associated with growth rate, body size, and metabolism in fishes. So these are genes that are already quite well characterized. Just as you saw uh, in the last uh, presentation by Louis about these co-expressed networks, so then we wanted to seek clusters or modules of genes that are related. And so here we have um, each of these modules or network, uh, sorry, it's a network of co-expressed genes. The colors are just, uh, are just representative, they, don't, they just represent a different uh, cluster. But you can see here we have a very strong signal in our data of ecotype, so modules that are significantly associated either with uh, upregulation uh, in one group or in the other group. And in fact, the signal of lake, so the sort of random effect uh, or local site effect of variation is much less consequential in these data. So what we, I would consider this an interesting case of parallel evolution by what I call non-parallel roots. So we can see endpoint phenotypes of repeated evolution of ecomorphs that are very similar in natural populations, but the way that they have arisen is very different. We see several key traits that are highly significantly shared, uh, and sorry, highly significantly uh, parallel, particularly related to the head, to the eye, uh, and to trophic use. But then we have a high level of population specificity in genomic differentiation. The, the different demographic histories uh, of these populations are, uh, are represented by a number of different possibilities, either that of a secondary contact with many different ages uh, involved in those or a sympatric divergence. Uh, and there was uh, very little sharing of these fundamental genetic variation, or sorry, fundamental genetic patterns that arise from this sort of variation. So we had almost no or none uh, shared variation at the genomic level as far as the response of, to demographic history and response to selection. We do see some effects of environment on this genetic diversity and phenotypic divergence. It was in the form of ecological opportunity. But then once we start to look at genetic regions, so response to selection at, 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 uh, at entire contigs, then we find there is now low parallelism but occasional uh, examples of, of shared selection at genetic regions. So that means that this is sort of overcoming the, the, the background noise and signals of, showing signals of selection. And then once we look at the functional molecular diversity, so the transcriptome, the expressed portion of the genome that, that, uh, that generates these phenotypes, then we see much higher levels of, 
of parallelism, both in levels of differential expression, so the, the levels of extent of the genes in their expression, and the relationship of the co-expressed networks. So that is where we have what we think of as kind of a transcriptome acting as a bridge to overcome this uh, very non-parallel past. And so I'd like to thank uh, all the co-authors on this work, the people in, in bold are, are, are the co-authors who are directly associated with the work and our funding sources for this re research. And thank you very much. Okay, thanks, Catherine. Uh, we could take one quick question. Uh, uh, we've been consistently four minutes behind since the opening of the uh, session, so we, we'll take one question if you have, have one. Uh, yes. So do you mean, sorry, in the phenotypes? Yeah. yeah. Uh, we are, have been exploring this a little bit, but because we have very few instances of, of sort of true sympatric divergence, um, so most of the cases are that of a secondary contact, then the number of uh, variables that differ are really high. So we have the period of isolation, the initial period of divergence, uh, is one, and then we have the duration of the period of isolation, the level of, and then the timing of those populations coming together, and then the level of admixture between those previously isolated groups. Uh, and so we have found, uh, I mean, I can imagine that at a, at a global level, this might be able to be distinguished, but at the level of, of having even 15 or 20 populations, it's not been possible to overcome so many different variables. But I think that this is a good point. We've been trying to explore ways that we can capture this consistency. Uh, but in our case, we find very little consistency, so. Okay, thanks. Uh, appreciate that. Thanks to all the speakers this morning.